Alice Y. Hom works in the philanthropy field as a director of, queer, of the Queer Justice Fund at the Asian American Pacific Islanders in Philanthropy and serves on the board of the directors for the Australia Lesbian Foundation for Justice. Alice received her PhD in history at Claremont College, Claremont Graduate University, excuse me, and her dissertation, Unifying Differences, Lesbian of Color Community Building in Los Angeles and New York, 1970s to 1980s, focuses on organizing by lesbians of color. She's the co-editor with, with David Ng of an award-winning anthology, Q&A, Queer and Asian in America. Alice lives in Los Angeles, enjoys eating good food with friends, and doesn't mind being called Namby Pamby because she's secure in her sissy dapper butchness. Thank you. Without further ado, Alice Y. Hom. Thank you. I'm going to sit down, but this is my outfit. Uh, it was my graduation suit to myself. If you're ever in LA, there's a store specifically for men 5'8 and under. So, yeah, check it out. <clears throat> it's called Jimmy Owl's um, Men's Store for Men 5'8 and Under. <laughs> It's in Beverly Hills, and at Butch Voices LA, there was a, um, uh, a fashion show, and he brought out some of his suits and did modeling there. It was very fabulous. He makes suits for women, too, and he talked about uh, law enforcement people who come, like women who are in law enforcement, and they have to have holsters with their guns, so they, you know, change the suit for them, and I was impressed by that. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I really want to thank Chris for introducing me. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, it's a little odd to have this kind of phallic thing right here. Um, <laughs> not that I'm used to it. Um, I know Chris from Occidental College because I used to work there, and Chris was a student when I was um, the director of the Intercultural Community Center, and we had some good times doing social justice work there. So thank you very much, Chris, for, for that. Um, Hello, how is everybody? Yeah, good. I know some of you might have just gotten off work or you've been here since yesterday. I really want to thank you for being here. I recognize it's a Friday afternoon. Um, people do work and the fact that you're all here today is, um, is heartening, so thank you. I'm, I'm really honored and excited and humbled to be here with you this afternoon as a keynote for Butch Voices 2011. I'd like to thank um, Joe LeBlanc and Chris Freeman for inviting me to share some of my stories, research, and experiences with you as a historian, um, community organizer, and educator who's a part of overlapping communities including AAPI, meaning Asian American and Pacific Islander, queer women of color, LGBTQ philanthropy, gender nonconforming, and butch, to name just a few. I also like to acknowledge Jean Cordova, who last year invited me to organize a panel for Butch Voices LA, where I had the opportunity to engage in conversations about the spectrum of gender differences, identities, and queer identities through the lenses of race, class, and sexuality, with my co-panelists, including Renyo Huang, Bo Lerungzerwat, Kimi Mojica, who's in the audience today, uh, Che Jung Fung, and Sandy Lee, the majority of whom did not identify as Butch, the ones who did were the older ones, myself and Sandy, who are in their 30s and 40s. And the younger ones were in their 20s. And they used genderqueer, transgender, masculine center, and a range of pronouns, including he, she, they, or they wanted their names to be used. So my title of, uh, the title of my talk today is Bromance, Mandates, and Kinship, Meditations on Identity Politics, Differences, and Community Building. Before I begin my talk, I'd like to be mindful of the folks who are not here today. I, was, um, I actually want to honor our ancestors by birth and choice, to folks who have passed on and who have helped pave the way for us to be here today. They helped lay the foundation upon which we have benefited and continue to build upon. I also want to remind ourselves of the countless others who aren't here out of fear, who feel they might not fit in, or who have political differences or those whose lived realities do not afford them the means or the ability to attend. With all of these in my, heart, in my mind and heart, I recognize it as a privilege to be here and a responsibility is not lost on me. It's kind of hard to like... <laughs> 
hold and talk at the same time. Um, as a baby dyke coming out in the mid to late 1980s, I was influenced and schooled by women of color feminists, white lesbian feminists, Asian Pacific lesbians, lesbian of color activists that I met, hung out with, and read about in books that were like lifelines for me. I'd like to dedicate this keynote to my friend, Young Song, who made a lasting impression on me when I met her in 1988, and whose passing by suicide in 2009 still leaves me with much sadness. Young was my first butch, a androgynous Asian American lesbian that I met and had a serious crush on, and she was not my, my last. In the 1980s, she didn't particularly identify as butch or Asian American, for that matter. So we would have serious debates and discussions about racial identity, lesbian identity, gender identity, and all those identities combined, all together while learning about each other, eating some tasty food, and getting my first taste of what a lesbian life was like and could be. After a quickie fling with each other, we became buddies and bromates and wingmen before, before those terms were even in common use. Just as my thoughts, perspectives, and multiple identities as an Asian American, queer, gender nonconforming butch woman have evolved and changed, so did Young's. Today, I'm going to talk about identity politics, differences, community building, and underlying all of it is love and compassion. As a community historian, I've always interested in what happened in the past and how we can learn from those experiences, challenges, and successes of those who have come before us. People who have been underrepresented, marginalized, and erased from dominant histories. How can we not make the same mistakes and better learn to do things in the present? Right now, you're going to actually have a chance to hear Audre Lorde. She's an African-American lesbian feminist, mother, warrior, writer, poet, and she gave a speech at the first March on Washington for Lesbian and Gay Rights in 1979. Anybody was there? Who, who's here? Great. Let's give a round of applause for that person. So this is... Um, her speech. For lesbians and gay men have always been in the vanguard of struggles for liberation and justice in this country and within our communities. The first national conference of third world lesbians and gay men met in Washington over the past four days and it was an outstanding success. Now, we have all come together to demonstrate our power as lesbians and gay men in behalf of our own rights. And this is the beginning of a new front, for we are saying to the world that the struggle of lesbians and gay men is a real and particular and inseparable part of the struggle of all oppressed people within this country. I am proud to raise my voice here this day as a black, lesbian, feminist committed to struggle for a world where all our children can grow free from the diseases of racism, of sexism, of classism, and of homophobia. For those oppressions are inseparable. I'm not sure if you did, were able to read cause some of the photos, but it says Third World Conference, Washington, D.C., October 12th to 15, 1979. The coming together of Asians, American Indians, Latins, and blacks. 1979, think about that a little bit. Some of you might not have been born. Um, maybe there were a twinkle in your parents' eyes <laughs> at that time. Um, uh, you know, there's no internet, there's no Twitter, there's no cell phones, there's nothing like that. Like, so you want to think about how did you find each other? Um, uh, where did you learn about each other? Those are just different ways that are not, 
uh, they're not like our reality now, right? Like you can just Google something right now and like a whole bunch of stuff pops up. And that wasn't the case in, uh, you know, 20, 30 years ago. So just think about that a little bit. Not many people know that the same weekend of the first March on Washington, there was a space for third world gays and lesbians to come together in solidarity with each other to address racism in the gay and lesbian community, homophobia in the racial ethnic communities, and to create a safe space for them to not have to deal with the oppressions that they felt on a daily level. However, at that conference that was billed for third world lesbians and gays, there were also some difficult and hard discussions because Asian Americans and Native Americans felt marginalized in that space. Although people had talked about third world connections, in reality, the majority African American and Latino participants made it hard for other issues and needs relevant to the Asian Americans and Native Americans to be addressed. What came out of that conference was a greater understanding of some of the experiences of Native Americans and Asian American lesbians and gay men, and that Asian Americans created a new collective, one of, its first, one of the first of its own kind in 1979. I'm aware that identity categories are contested, shift, and evolve over time based on many factors, including social, cultural, historical, political, economic. Identities are fluid and transitory in one individual life and over time. I wrote my dissertation on lesbian of color identity formations, and what I learned and know through my own experiences is that multiple identities are not simply the sum of racial, gendered, sexualized identities meaning like, oh, I have three different, you know, minoritized identities. It's not about a numbers game. Um, rather, they are complex constructs negotiated dynamically in relationship to each other. When someone uses a term like gender or masculinity, I'm not thinking solely gender. I'm already thinking of it in racialized, sexualized, and classed terms. kind of hard to see this picture. It's from 1994. It's from Details Magazine, which is a men's magazine. Um, and it shows, you know, an Asian American man um, dressed a certain kind of way. And the, the tagline that you see in green that you're not able to read, it says, gay or Asian, right? So it's, it's as if you got to be gay or you got to be Asian. You can't be both. And then let's kind of like look a little more closely at what, uh, like the descriptions of it, okay? So uh, you see the arrow pointing to um, the head. It's about sunglasses, and it's about Dior sunglasses. Um, you talk about the hair, and it's like Ryan Seacrest hair. I guess Ryan Seacrest was way back there then too, not just like now. Um, the jacket is Dolce & Gabbana suede jacket. Um, they point to the fingers and they say things like, lady boy fingers, soft and long, perfect for both waxing, and, both waxing on and waxing off, plucking the koto or gripping the kendo stick. The bag is a Louis Vuitton bag, and it says, don't be duped by ghetto knockoffs. Every queen deserves the real deal. Um, Evisu jeans, $400. A bonsai ass requires delicate tending. Uh, up above, like right here in the middle, it says, one cruises for chicken, like this is for gay or Asian. One cruises for chicken, the other takes it general cho style. Whether you're into shrimp balls or shaved balls, entering the dragon requires imperial taste. So choke up on your chopsticks and make sure your labels are showing. Study hard, grasshopper. A sharp eye will always take home the plumpest eel. I don't even really understand all that, what I was trying to say. But it's, it's obviously, it smacks, right, of racism, homophobia, sexism, stereotypes, etc. And I put up intersecting ident... Pardon? It was Details Magazine in 1994. Uh, April 19, uh, excuse me, 2004. Yeah, rewind, 2004. Um, and there was a lot of protests about this, right? So Asian American queer groups, other ally organizations, uh, organized, made details, retract that, put out an apology. Um, 
and and it's a and I show that because it's kind of hard to kind of tell, you know, like, are they just being sexist here? Are they just being homophobic? Are they just being racist? It's like all of those oppressions happening at the same time, right? And in this picture, you know, it's obviously talking about masculinity. It's always talking about Asian American masculinity. Where in this metaphorical picture do you think an Asian American butch lesbian or queer woman can be? Really not there and maybe you don't want to be there, but you really can't be anywhere. Because when you think about Asian American stereotypes, they're gendered, right? So men are supposed to be infeminate, smart, nerdy, you know, like the whole kung fu choppy thing, or, um, and the women usually are hypersexualized, hyperfeminized, they're the bridesmaids, they're the bri male order brides, they're prostitutes because of all the different wars, that happen in Asian countries. Um, the domestics, the men are also domestic. So like historically those have changed, those kinds of stereotypes. Um, and you're not able to see Asian American lesbians. Immediately what you see or what you can think of is um, Asian American gay men. And I think what I grapple with a lot is um, how difficult it is because we're not only fighting amongst ourselves, but we're also fighting structurally. We're fighting structural, institutional racism, sexism, homophobia. They're all working together in combination. Um, you remember the picture of me and Young, right? Young's really handsome. Um, Young and I would walk down the street together, lovey-dovey, holding hands. And once we were, um, uh, you know, accosted, assaulted, verbally assaulted by uh, a car of white young men. And usually when I see white young men, they scare me a little bit, you know. So um, they're driving by and they scream fags at us. And we look at them and we say, we're dykes, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right? They, they mistook us for, for being fags. And then we got a little scared because, you know, they could come back. Um, and I, I want to share that story. I also want to share that, you know, white gay men cruise me often, thinking that I'm a gay bottom Asian boy. And that right there also talks about, okay, how are they reading me? How are they not reading me, misreading me, et cetera? Um, and unfortunately, Asian American lesbian just doesn't come up. Right? And we need to think about that a little bit. Um, let me go into talking about differences, right? Who, who can read that right from there? Anybody from the audience want to read it? And Semeca wearing the hat. That's a great quote by Audre Lorde, right? And it's a great quote, but in practice, it's really hard, right? So I want to talk a little bit about putting things into practice. Too often people take differences to mean division and as something that divides us. And that commonality is what brings us together because we share something similarly. But these are not all truisms. Depending on how one thinks about and models and practices differences can be unifying, and commonality does not always bring us together. Witness the troubles that we have here, you know? Um, so there are many variables like historical context, institutional structures, cultural experiences, social locations, power and privilege that all factor in to make a far more complicated and complex picture than we assume. For instance, Historian Horacio Ramirez asks how we might reframe the Stonewall Rebellion of 1969, which is typically marked according to mainstream general history perspectives as the decisive moment for gay and lesbian li uh, liberation. While some histories of Stonewall note the presence of black and gay, a black and Latino gay youth, drag queens of color, 
butch lesbians who resisted the police in the riot. Rarely is there any movement beyond the notion of Stonewall still being only a gay and lesbian moment. Ramirez asks questions about the Stonewall riot that mark specific racial class and gender aspects of that liberation moment. Quote, was Stonewall only a sex riot? Could we consider it a race riot? Was this overwhelmingly a white police force repressing a queer community largely of color, specifically black and Latino? To take Ramirez's questions further, could the Stonewall riot be also seen as a gender riot because of the butch lesbians and drag queens of color who transgressed societal norms for what was considered appropriate for male and female dress and behavior? Using an intersectional lens enables us to view our histories, our lived experiences and struggles in all its multiplicities, contradictions and complexity. What I found is that there are other ways to think about divisions and the exclusivity and limitations of identity categories. My work argues that lesbian of color, act lesbian of color activists use difference as a political strategy, not to divide, but as a way to create new forms of community and solidarity for those who are multiply marginalized. In this sense, difference and identity are generative rather than destructive and further the possibilities of new identities, communities, and social movements from a both and perspective as opposed to an either or mode. Like as if we have a choice that we could make over one or another. Um, how many of you know Entezake Shange? Cool, she's a, a writer, playwright, um, African-American feminist. Uh, so she, was, she gave a talk and someone asked her, do you consider yourself black first or a woman? And she said, I don't know, honey, they both happened at the same time. <laughs> right? Sometimes I hear people say that they do not like to be put in a box of this identity or that identity and question the necessity for such categories. So I give talks at different college campuses a lot. I get this a lot from students who, like, you know, they hear me talk and they say, but, you know, why do we, why do we need to say we're this or that? And, you know, my inner voice says something else, but then the outer voice says something, right? <clears throat> so, you know, my tempered response goes something like this. You know, I, I can understand how you might see identity categories as limiting, and I'm not suggesting that anyone has to claim an identity if they don't feel the need. Um, but you have the luxury to be in this position of not having to self-identify because there were others who came before you who had to lose their lives who had to get beaten up, who had to sometimes go to jail, had to uh, sacrifice in order for them to name African American, Asian American, Latino, Chicano, Native American, and have self-determining uh, terms as opposed to be calling Oriental, Negro, um, wetback, flip for Filipino, monkey, you know, like there's these terms that people sort of put on us because they see us as minorities, usually people of color, um, and folks were not going to take it. So I say that to folks, but I also recognize, you know, we're at another moment. This happened and these moments happened, 1960s, very particular moment, 1970s, very particular moment, 1980s, who was the president, very particular moments. And we have to think about uh, these identities as shifting over historical time. Um, and in my dissertation, I write about lesbians of color, and people might think that's a homogenized you know, umbrella term, but I talk about generations. I talk about generations of lesbians of color. The ones who came out in the 1970s are different from the ones who came out in the 1980s. And I actually don't use coming out, I actually talk about as when they arrived at their lesbian of color political consciousness. Right, so it's a political consciousness they had, not that they're just like, uh, oh yeah, I'm you know, a person of color, I'm a woman, I'm a lesbian, I must be a lesbian of color. It's like, no, there's, there's a political consciousness around that. And um, I think that allows us to kind of understand that at some point there wasn't a lesbian of color consciousness, right? Just like there wasn't uh, an Asian American consciousness, that term, was started in the late 60s. Not to say that 
Asian American people didn't exist before the 1960s. We obviously did, but a political consciousness around that did not exist. So I, I want us to kind of think about that too, about a political consciousness, that these are political identities and that these are terms, but also that there are moments for pride, community, coming together at the same time. Um, they risked much of themselves to define themselves as feminists, as women of color, as Chicanas, as Asian Americans, as people of color, lesbians of color, at a time not so long ago when these identities, community organizations, and cultural productions did not exist. Admittedly, sometimes I feel dismay at the lack of understanding from people who hold that perspective of like, why do I need to identify myself? Yet with the long view of someone who has experienced and struggled to make sure our past histories are not forgotten and are taught and learned by others, I can understand why new generations of people have a different set of conditions and contexts now. They have created new forms of identity, including the refusal to claim one. They have generated new community formations and ways of working with each other, just as our antecedents had done. And like those earlier activists, are calling into question past ways and current realities. So one such reality that I just want to throw in because you know, I don't think it gets talked about a lot is butch desire. There's a multitude of ways to identify you know, as butch, masculine center, soft butch, stone butch, hard butch, baby butch, AG stud, namby pamby, which is my favorite, um, <laughs> sissy butch, dapper butch, etc. But I'm not hearing a lot about the diversity of butch desire. So I've named this subtitled Butch Femme Binary Fatigue. <laughs> and I'm careful to use butch femme as a binary, right? Um, I'm not trying to say that, I'm not trying to erase butch femme relationships. I'm not trying to erase people who want to be in butch femme couplings. Um, I'm not denying or, or erasing butch femme histories, friendships, relationships. What I'm talking about is um, making more visible other forms of butch desire and butch erotics that don't fit into the butch femme binary, which predominates. I would say that it predominates. We can have a debate about that. Um, I've exampled, I, I've, for example, I've witnessed um, some phobia and dismay over butch on butch couplings. Right? Some of this from butches and some from femmes. There's, a, there's, I think, a loss and a lament from some femmes who say, where are all the butches? Right? Some of them say, well, they're transitioning or um, they're no longer identifying as butch. They're identifying in other ways. Uh, I had uh, a really dear friend of mine who identifies as a high femme, very high femme. Uh, she puts her makeup on while driving and I'm like, don't do that. Um, <laughs> And uh, she once said to me, you know, as long as you don't start identifying as trans, you know, like, don't, don't leave the butches. And that's really hard to, like, you know, hear and take from someone who I'm very close with, right? Um, and I think part of that is fear, you know, that's coming from fear. I think it's coming from loss. I think it's coming from a lot of wounds. I think... Um, uh, what it really says is speaks more about the person who's saying it as opposed to what they're saying to me. Uh, and I recognize all that because we live in a society that doesn't support us, that doesn't appreciate us. We don't see visual representations of us in particular ways, not on TV, not on the web, I would venture to say, um, and maybe not in so, such positive light. Um, and there are other kinds of bromances and kinship that we have each with each other. Right? Like I could be friends with other butches and not uh, be in competition with each other. Um, I, I dated somebody who identified as gender variant and wanted, to be used, wanted me to use the male pronoun. So I would tell my friends, oh, I'm dating you know, him, et cetera. And then my friends were like, what? You know, I actually think my sister's here. And um, <laughs> I love my sister. Um, I am the baby of the family, um, but yeah, <laughs> right? But 
I, I think I remember telling them that, like my sisters, that I'm dating somebody and I used he, and they were like, oh, are you still a lesbian? Right? Because when you use he, and so it's like this kind of, this questioning happens, right? And I, I sometimes wonder, like, you know, maybe it doesn't have to be so, like, what is heterosexual, right? What is homosexual? I could date someone as a he and I still identify as, you know, a, a butch dyke, as a lesbian, right? Or um, I think sometimes these terms, right, they do have restrictions. They kind of imprison us in some ways. Um, and there's some fluidity to that. And some people are not down for that. And that's fine too. Because I had one friend who was an ex. Um, and she's like, I just don't get it. I'm like, it's not for you to get. Right? It's really not for you to get. It's just for you to support me, understand me, know that you know, my preferences are of a certain kind. And they're not always supported. The uh, panel last year in LA, um, it was called uh, Bromance, Mandates, and Kinship, Unveiling Taboo Topics. Part of that was because I really wanted to have like a butch on butch, you know, panel. I couldn't get any other Asian American, you know, folks to kind of be on that panel with me. I know you're out there, but, um, <laughs> I, you know, just by limitation and I, I just like, we, we, I couldn't do it. So I'm like, I got a, a bunch of friends together and we said, well, they didn't identify as butch, so I took out, you know, un unveiling butch taboos to taboo topics, right? Because, like, I wanted to be um, conscientious of the folks who were there. And I also wanted to be conscientious that sometimes it's a taboo to talk about butch on butch. And sometimes it's a taboo because I think in some ways it's a little homophobic, right? And we don't talk about that. So, you know, I hope we have a chance to, to share. Yeah, so I, I hope we have an opportunity to, to talk about that a little bit. So community building. Um, these pictures are not going to uh, necessarily match with what I'm talking about, but that's okay because I want us to have that kind of dichotomy, right? So this is the, this is the group of folks who were a part of that panel, all of us in our splendor. Um, building community. Building community with people can be hard, right? It's messy, it's complicated, it's invigorating, it's empowering, it's amazing, it's anxiety-inducing, it's anger-provoking, it's lovely, it's wonderful, it's transformational, all at the same time and over the long haul. One way that Butch Voices is following a long tradition is holding a conference to bring people together. Another thing that Butch Voices is experiencing are the challenges of bringing people together who have different perspectives, desires, histories, and privileges. It's what my boss, Peggy Saika, likes to say, the agony and the ecstasy of community building. One form of community building is to form an organization in a group, right? So you feel like, you know, three people can form an organization. You are a group right there. Um, for example, in 1974, a group of African-American and Latina lesbians in New York came together to form one of the first lesbian of color organizations in the country, Salsa Soul Sisters. And the colon after that was Salsa Soul Sisters, Third World Gay Women. The first way that you saw it, women was spelled W-I-M-M-I-N, right? Um, later they changed it to W-O-M-E-N. Their mission statement was that it's for all lesbians of color of different racial backgrounds. But in reality and in practice, the majority of the women who were in leadership roles were African-American lesbians and a few Latinas. Some Asian-American lesbians who attended their events did not feel welcomed or felt that the space was for them. They started their own groups. Some Latina lesbians expressed their critique about the leadership and how they would also like a space for different languages other than English. There were major fights and challenges in the end, the Latinas left Salsa Soul, which they always felt was more soul than salsa. Um, salsa Soul soon changed its name to African Ancestral Lesbians United for Societal Change, which still exists in New York today, right? So 1974, can you imagine? 1974, we're having fights about ERA, uh, women's rights, lesbian feminism is in its heyday. Um, 
and there's backlash to the 60s. Um, I also want to share another example of a conference in 1983, happened in Malibu, it was the first lesbian of color conference, and how amazing is that, right? Like you, I think you know, like your very first conference to see somebody of your own kind is beautiful, right? It's like, oh my God, there's more than one of us. I am not alone. It's just like, you know, butch voices I heard in the opening remarks today, this morning, somebody said, uh, you know, their first conference was transformational for them. Uh, somebody said they missed the first one out of fear and they wanted to come to the second one. So I recognize that these spaces are different from other people, right? We have different ways and needs and desires for being here, um, and we want to get different things out of it. And that's kind of hard to hold. But in this Lesbian of Color conference in 1983 in Malibu, uh, a group called Lesbians of Color organized it. Um, and you know, you get a group of people together, it's messy sometimes, right? Things happen. And what happened at that conference was um, uh, women of color started asking each other, you know, why are straight women here, right? Some of the straight women that were there were allies, and they were invited to be there to, you know, talk about ally work as feminists of color. Another, you know, critique and question came up with, you know, who is a woman, who is a lesbian of color? You're lighter skinned than I am. You're not really, you know, a lesbian of color. So there was fight around skin color, which was not just necessarily about black skin color, but it was about Latinas who passed. Um, and, you know, I share these examples about that because it's hard, it's difficult, and we have uh, different places where we come from that allows us to be in spaces that are wounded and hurt, and we have to speak out against that. But we also have to recognize at the same time, people are trying, right? And they all have good intentions. Um, and at the same time, we just have to recognize sometimes we can be oppressed and oppress others too, right? And that's hard because you just, you know, sometimes you just want to, well, there's a lot against me, but like, okay, I'm educated. I, you know, I now have a certain class background. Um, I'm not going to forget that I came from working class background. Um, I have some privileges because of the PhD that other people don't. Um, I recognize that, and I recognize that, you know, you're all listening to me because I'm the keynote. There's some responsibility to that. And I, I want to hold, like, you know, we have responsibility and we can be accountable to each other. We can also be loving with each other. We can have compassion for each other and recognize that not all of us are coming from the same places. And that's okay. Um, and I, you know, it's, 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 we're human and we're imperfect and it's complicated. And one thing that I learned is that even with the best intentions, things can go awry and we are not immune from practicing the very thing that we are organizing against. And this all relates back to power, privilege, paying attention to, and being accountable to knowing that we can be oppressed and oppressive at the same time. I find that interweaving differences provides a generative opportunity to create solidarity between communities and to open a space for even more complex understandings of identities and issues than were previously imagined. Building community based on difference and a shared analysis of multiple oppressions was not easy, is not easy, but it gives us a model of organizing from the margins to the center and thus creating a blueprint for true inclusion. We continue to face differences today, and I see these critiques, the uncomfortable space of naming our wounds, expressing our hurts, and naming our needs, and they are practice for us, right? There's just practice for us to do. I can remember how hard it is to say, you know, to a lover or to, a, you know, your girlfriend, really what you said to me really hurt me. And wondering how they're going to react. Are they going to respond by shouting back, being angry, or saying, I can hear you. I'm sorry I did that. Um, all of what I shared today shows to me that we're still works in progress, 
and we're trying to change conditions that are structural, institutional, as well as individual. And it's, a hard, and it's hard to fight all of those at the same time, right? I am hopeful and I am an optimist. I forgot, I was, <laughs> I forgot to change pictures. Um, these are folks who, you know, they're building community with each other. With each other. This picture is from uh, a queer lead, an a queer API leadership summit that happened in Chicago. And we thought, oh my god, everyone's wearing a, a tie and a vest. Let's take a picture. Okay. Um, this is from LA. It was uh, a panel on Asian American organizing from the 70s through the 90s. You can see D'Lo in the middle. You'll see D'Lo later. Um, but the other people that you see is Darina Wong. She's the one with the coffee cup. Darina Wong is a longtime activist who, uh, whenever she was faced with, oh, there's no group for me, she's going to make one. So she did. Every place that she went, Philadelphia, you know, there's a Philly Asian Lesbians group that she started, DECALS, DC Asian Lesbians Conference, you know, group. She came to San Francisco. She was a part of Asian Pacifica Sisters back in the um, 90s. You see Riku Matsuda, who's from LA, Eileen Ma, who's now the new uh, director of API Equality in LA, and Gina Masakizme, who wrote her dissertation on uh, Vietnamese American lesbians and started um, uh, a group called Omoy. Dilo Jun Fung, what? Um, you know, us again. This is a picture that I wanted to kind of end on, or there's two pictures like this. Um, and I want to end on uh, some hopeful things, right, about building community. And right now I work in an organization called Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in Philanthropy. Um, and I started that job about four years ago, and I was hired to work on a gender and equity campaign. And my boss said to me, after we had, you know, gotten started, this um, campaign is on its way. I think they hired me also so I can, you know, bring in the sexuality part and talk about race, gender, sexuality. Um, and uh, she said, you know, we, we need to talk about gays and lesbians, the LGBTQ community. And she uses words like LGBTQ community. Um, and she said, you know, what about the funding to API LGBTQ organizations? And basically, there's not a lot of it, right? So um, the amount of money, of foundation dollars, that goes to LGBTQ organizations and organizing work is 0.2%. 0.2%, not even 1%, 0.2%. This is foundation money. Um, in 2009, uh, that represented about $100 million, give or take, $100 or so million. Uh, queer people of color groups got 9% of that. All right, so let me, okay. 100 odd million to LGBTQ groups, people of color LGBTQ groups or issues or programs got 10%. That's, you know, that's outrageous, right? I mean, it's outrageous that LGBTQ people are getting such li little money. I mean, 100 million is a lot to me, right? But <laughs> in the grand scheme of things, it's, it's not a lot. Um, and then when I, you know, digged a little deeper, how much money is going to Asian American LGBTQ groups? $650,000. $650,000, give or take. That's outrageous that, you know, and what's, what's great about working for APIP is there's a recognition that that is outrageous. And there's a recognition that queer API people are a part of APIP. There, there doesn't have to be this fight about like, well, you know, why, you know, why are we, why are we working on LGBTQ issues? Because that is part and parcel of the work that we do. It is about building democratic philanthropy. Um, and this picture right here is a group 
of 19 youth API LGBTQ youth activists. And guess where we're at? It's the White House, right? So this is in, not the West Wing, but it's in the executive, the Eisenhower Executive Office Building, right next door to the White House. And there are API LGBTQ youth activists. Um, Obama has a, uh, a commission on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. He has an openly gay commissioner on that. Um, and there's some advocates here. And here we are in front of the White House, right? It's amazing that we have an opportunity to talk about API, LGBTQ youth e issues, and give recommendations to the policies that are happening on a federal level. And this can only happen because there are people in the White House and who work for Obama who recognize that this is a need and a concern. There's the White House Initiative on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders who recognize that there are LGBTQ people a part of this. There's APIP who was able to give a grant to an organization to get those folks there. And this to me is an example of the hope that we have. Because it's not just about you know, just us, like who is Asian American, who is queer, like we are all working together to enact some change, right? Like this is what movement building is about. Um, and that makes me hopeful, right? And there's still, we can still critique the White House, we can still critique Obama, and at the same time, there's stuff happening and work that needs to happen, and it is going on. So I wanna, I wanna kind of end on that note a little bit. I, um, I have two more just kind of paragraphs. I had a lot to say. <clears throat> um, and I, I want to quote, you know, a femme. So I'm going to bring in Joan Nessel. And she wrote this in the foreword for Persistence, Always Butch and Femme. The lesbian world of genders were changing all around me, in language and style, in biology as destiny being recreated or refused, in new kinds of masculinities new kinds of erotic partnerships that delight in shifting bodies, new expressions of femme power, of snapping jaws, new combinations of identities alongside disavowals of all fixed gender selves, through femmes and butch speaking for themselves, uncoupled, and differently gendered people weaving their complex selves through ancestral homes. My hope is that through butch spaces like Butch Voices and with the people here, Throughout this weekend, we can show love, compassion, and pa patience with each other as we create, dream, and implement new visions and new formations while also recognizing the foundations built on old understandings, ways, and experiences. Thank you very much.